It has arrived after much ado, Mohawks, maggots, and machines. Thrones of Delay is launching sometime very soon. Don't have released it yet. And today we're gonna be breaking down the trailer, covering everything you need to know about lords, heroes, units, and mechanics for the newest in a long line of Warhammer 3 DLC. Tamarkan the Maggot Lord, Elspeth Von Draken, the Dark Lady of Nuln, and Malachi McKyson, the Slayer Engineer, will be the headlining lords here. So uh, the prediction video from a few weeks ago will end up being quite accurate. There are a handful of key differences, particularly on the Dwarfen side, and we will enumerate those as we go through. The Empire, Nurgle, and what may very well be the first Horde-style faction for the Dawi will all be looking to make waves with a new host of units and playstyles, and will be joined by the Free Lord Epidemius, the Urfather's chosen tallyman. So as expected, the entire conflict presented here is based on the Tamarkan Throne of Chaos army book, very same book where the Chaos Lords received their full roster on the tabletop game. It's a really important narrative, responsible for fleshing out many factions and characters, and it depicts the rise of the Maggot Lord from the ruins of Zan Bajin, his champion of Chaos-style gauntlet to become the Chosen of the Dark Gods, his subjugation and subsequent alliance with the Legion of Osgor, led by Drazo at the Ashen, all culminating in a cataclysmic siege of Nuln, the jewel of the Empire, where the Imperial Gunnery School and many of its devices are developed and implemented. And that's what the trailer is all about. Really, a four-way war between the Empire and the Dwarfs on one side, with all their crazy contraptions and gunpowder technology against the Chaos Dwarfs, and much more importantly here, the stinking hordes of Nurgle, led by a puppet master worm who can burrow deep into flesh and control the lifeless corpses of its victims. Like the trailer a lot, no fancy narration or world building really, just straight into the action to give us a spicy glimpse at everything that's coming and it is a lot, so let's jump into the details. First up, we have the Graveyard Rose, Elspeth Von Draken, one of the most powerful Amethyst Wizards of an age. She is the chosen representative of Nuln, one of the most important cities in the Empire and therefore wields considerable influence over matters of the state more particularly, matters of magic and death. She's got that pale scythe. Moore's realm is essentially the afterlife for men and women of the Empire, and the tending of its gardens is an eternal concern for the Empire in a world where demons can steal souls and vampires can raise the dead. Ensuring that one's essence and being is safeguarded against the predations of chaos or necromancy is extremely important, and Elspeth is one of the leading figures in the Empire in her understanding of death and how to wield its winds for the good of her people. She rides a great Carmine Dragon that can unleash sorceress blasts of raw, powerful Shaiish magic, capable of withering metal and rending flesh to dust as if millennia had passed in mere seconds, and naturally wields the wind of Shaiish herself, which is one of the stronger lores of magic in the game. Purple Sun for clearing hordes, Fate of Buna for deleting high value infantry or cav with a single click. Spirit Leech for sniping lords, and Host of Debuffs for enemy formation. So, she's gonna be extremely powerful. A lot of ways for her to beat you. She'll be good in melee on a dragon. She'll have lots of good spells to cast. She'll have a ton of ways to approach any given scenario, and lots of ways to beat you as well. In terms of units, we have confirmation that the Marienburg Landship, Steam Tank Volley Gun, Nuln Ironsides, Hawkland Long Rifles, Knights of the Black Rose, Master Engineer Lord Variant, Engineer Hero Variant, and Theodore Bruckner, astride his unique Demigriff Reaper, will be joining her in action, some of which are going to be really cool additions. The Marienburg Landship is just a gigantic weapons platform, bristling with cannons, deck sweepers, and powerful gunpowder accoutrement, serving as the big centerpiece unit here, but the Hellblaster Volley Gun Steam Tank Variant should add a bunch more firepower on top of that, and I'm expecting some buffs and reworking of steam tanks in general. It's something I've been pushing for internally for quite some time. Just the fact that they can be chunked down by fodder, chaff, and low-tier missile fire so easily has always been kind of lame. I'd also love to see some visual upgrades for steam tanks too. Their textures are looking pretty dated at this point. Would like to see them get a shiny new facelift. The engineers can ride mechanical horses and possibly even steam tanks as mounts, wielding grenade launchers and long-range rifles while supporting all the new gunpowder toys and artillery, which would be a super fun new Lord variant. Nuln Ironsides are armored elite range units with repeater handguns, similar to the six-barrel Cyclone of Death Marcus Kruber uses in Vermintide, while Hawkland Long Rifles are sniper Gisele equivalents, small weapon teams with big punch and range for taking down high-value targets. The Knights of the Black Rose are closely associated with Moor, God of Death, 
heavily armored and inspiring fear in their jet black armor and death like visage. And Theodore Bruckner, legendary hero, is the Titan Headsman, personal executioner and champion of the Electra Countess of Nome. Dude is a straight badass, a powerful duelist, heavily armored, and a leader of elite knights on a massive bird lion of prey. When it comes to campaign mechanics, the Imperial Gunnery School can kit out artillery and gunpowder troops, perhaps in a similar manner to Ickit's Workshop, and upgrade into powerful abilities in return for schematics that are earned as your ranged troops deal damage and achieve certain kill thresholds and missions. The implication here is that Elspeth's magics will somehow be incorporated into these upgrades, combining Shaiish with the already deadly contraptions of one of the premier armories in the entire world, to create new variants of Amethyst units, which will presumably have unique properties blended into their weaponry. The Gardens of Moor can be constructed across the Empire, allowing Elspeth and her army to fast travel to a limited number of locations, and should provide a more asymmetrical playstyle than what we're used to for human factions. Basically, if you see an invasion force massing near Ostermark or across the Empire elsewhere, you can quickly construct a garden and reinforce that position without having to force march for six or seven turns to get there. Could see that being very handy. And if we take anything away from this on the Empire side, is that their now heavier emphasis on gunpowder weaponry should be very scary. And that's an underrated element of the Empire and the lore. People tend to think because they're normal humans against hellish creatures from the ether, they're kind of just barely holding on, right? But the reality is the Empire, especially when you look at them from the chaos perspective, is terrifying. They have to be to survive and even thrive against all these unspeakable horrors. And when you're a random unnamed gore or marauder and you're faced with the looming battlements and overwhelming firepower of a trained warlike people, the Empire is the one who knocks, not necessarily the forces of chaos. And there's very little more devastating than seeing your homies get smeared by grape shot and dismembered by high explosives 300 yards from melee combat. Yeah, you might be in a numberless horde, but the Empire has lots of tools for destroying numberless hordes, and they're really good at it. They've honed that over centuries of warfare. That's what Nolan brings to the table here, and should make the faction a lot more fun to play with that heavier emphasis on gunpowder now. Next up, we have Nurgle, which of course will also be receiving some general campaign reworks and tweaking. More on that to come very soon. But the head boobos in charge is indeed Tamarkan, the Maggot Lord, or Tamarkan, Tamarkan, I don't care how you say it. Sentient, gigantic worm that wriggled its way into the rot bloated corpse of the powerful ogre tyrant Karaka Break Mountain, and now puppet masters his gargantuan form like Metallica. He is one of the greatest ever champions of the Plague Father, and has but one aim to spread death and disease in the name of the Lord of Pestilence. His Feast of the Maggot Lord ability triggers upon death dealing life-sapping damage upon the enemy to keep him in the thick of battle a little while longer, which reflects how he fights in the lore. Multiple times throughout his story arc, he appears to be slain by a foe, but suddenly erupts forth from flesh to latch himself to a new victim, digging through their mouth and throat to inhabit the corpse and continue his rampage. But doesn't sound like he'll have a body-changing mechanic here. Instead, riding the mighty Toad Dragon Bubalos, his campaign will focus on dominating and recruiting powerful warlords from across the Chaos, Norskin, and Dawizar rosters to serve as his lieutenants. These unique, heroic chieftains will come with their own skill trees, effects, and unit selections, allowing Tamarkan to amass a horde more akin to an ever-chosen than a traditional legendary Lord of Nurgle. But of course, Putrid Pestilence will still be the main focus, which means he'll be joined by Kassik the Befouled as a legendary hero, Captain of the Rot Knights, and the Khan's personal cavalry commander. Chaos Lord of Nurgle, Chaos Sorcerer of Nurgle, Plague Ogres, Rot Knights, Toad Dragons, Pestigors, and Bile Trolls will also be joining in the fun. Now, in contrast to the Dawi and Empire unit selections, I'm not entirely sure the new units here are going to change the game for Nurgle all that much. In fact, Rot Knights may be the only unit that really changes how Nurgle plays on the battlefield. Heavily armored, elite shot cav riding ugly man bear pig dog hound things. They'll probably have regen, AP, and a nasty stat line as monstrous cavalry. So certainly an upgrade and higher price point than standard chaos knights. And that regen is a big deal. It'll mean they can cycle charge and use their mobility with impunity using hit and run tactics to heal up and cause all sorts of problems. But the rest is just going to be flare and spice to round out that core Nurgle playstyle of healing, 
high HP and monstrous units. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I'd say that while the Dawi and the Empire are adding some new dynamics that will completely change how they play on the battlefield, I'm not sure that will be true for Nurgle. Toad Dragons are gigantic single entity monsters with huge HP pools, corrupted breath attacks, and unyielding mass to push through any foe. Really cool looking monster with some wild animations, joined by Plague Ogres, both great weapon and regular variants, Pastagores, and Bile Trolls. Plague Ogres are going to be a tankier, more elite variant of Ogre Bulls. Bile Trolls certainly hope are just going to be another useless variant of Troll, with no real defining gameplay characteristics of their own. Think making them single entities, or at least giving them some kind of breath attack, would make them quite a bit more interesting to play. And Pestigors, I'm frankly not expecting all that much from after the Zongors. They'll be mid-tier again, which makes sense given the rosters they're on, where Chaos Warriors and Chosen already have the expensive elite infantry on lock. But it will always be eternally weird to me that God-marked Gores are somehow significantly less elite than Bestigors, right? Gameplay-wise, I get why Creative Assembly did it. It's kind of the same logic as putting White Lions on the High Elves roster at mid-tier, even though in lore and tabletop, they're more equivalent to Swordmasters, just because that's a hole in the roster that needs filling. Presumably, they don't want to give the Mono Gods a bunch of Beastmen units that are literally better than the Beastmen roster itself, and I totally get that. But the whole point of being blessed with the Dark Gods, of being granted gifts from them, is that it inherently makes you stronger, better, faster, longer. So Godmark Gores are best of Gores. They're the best of the Gores, which makes it just kind of a weird juxtaposition. So I guess it's the gameplay sacrifice. Not my favorite thing in the world, but I get why they did it. In campaign, expect Tamarkan to focus more on the mortal side of the Nurgle roster. Remember that the Mono Gods are not demon factions. They're mortal and demon. And in the lore, his horde is more Warriors of Chaos focused than demonic focused, but he should still have a nice mix and be trying to spread disease and decay with a healthy dosage of multiple types of units. And then we have Malachi McKyson, Slayer Engineer for the Dawi, a character I was not expecting to be the headlining legendary lord, but I can see why Creative Assembly went for him because he is certainly the most unique of the options available, even if I wouldn't really classify him as a lord. Malachi was once a member of the Legendary Engineers Guild before disaster struck. His dwarf ironclad Unsinkable sunk on its maiden voyage, and his Thunder Barge Indestructible destructed on its maiden flight. With a bunch of Dawi dying in both accidents, Malachi was ejected from the guild, his shame proving so great he took the Slayer Oath, but continued his engineering pursuits with the Spirit of Grungni, a new airship famously depicted in Gotrek and Felix. He's also tied to the known gunnery school, where he teaches and tinkers as an academic. So even from a lore perspective, it makes sense that he's in this lord pack, even though he's not really part of the rivalry between Elspeth and Tamarkan. Now, Grim Burlaxon and Joseph Bugman were the other two realistic Dawi candidates, and I'm actually glad CA went with Malachi instead, because he's frankly more interesting than the other two. Again, I don't really think of him as a lord or a leader of armies, but he's got immense personality. He's basically insane. He has a whole arsenal of crazy contraptions to utilize, which means his skill tree should be very cool. And he uses a freaking RPG to explode a dragon in Dragon Slayer. He does all kinds of insane shit. I cannot wait to see what hijinks the dude gets up to. Not to mention his close ties to Thunder Barges in general, which will be the main centerpiece unit for the dwarfs in this update, and his own unique airship, the Spirit of Grungni, which will follow him into battle. So he's going to be by far the biggest departure from previous Dwarf Lords, and really add a lot of flavor and fun to the roster. As I've said many times before, gameplay trumps lore when it's a conflict between the two, and the gameplay implications here more than make up for the fact that Malachi wouldn't truly be a leader of armies or empire builder. And obviously, we hope that his objectives and campaign mechanics will be a bit different than your standard Thorgrim or Belagar Ironhammer. As I said, he is not a creator of empires, I want to see something a little bit more unique for him, and his objective should be tied into that. His legendary airship can be upgraded with buildings and likely recruit on the move, serving as a mobile city of sorts, so horde gameplay is expected here, and his adventures with Gotrek and Felix, who may very well be getting some reworks in this update, will test his deadly weaponry and innovations in perilous battles throughout the old world and beyond. So in battle, he's going to be a ranged support lord, 
tossing cinder blast cluster bombs and deranged munitions, blowing people to pieces with his shotgun, and smacking them around with a wrench. You'll be joined by Garagrim Iron Fist, legendary hero son of Ungrim, war mourner of the Slayer Keep, a Demon Slayer Lord, a Dragon Slayer Hero, Doom Seekers, the Goblin Hewer, Thunder Barge, Grudge Raker Thunderers, and Slayer Pirates. Long drawn, here we come, baby. Remember them all the way back from the Call of Warhammer 1.6 and beginning of the end times days. Those were good times. So a heavy Slayer theme here with just obscene ranged firepower in the form of that Thunder Barge. Expect that to be like 3,000 plus gold just blasting apart armies as it floats above. Cannons and gunfire and bomb drops from on high. If you don't have flyers to shut that baby down, you're going to be in big trouble. Demon Slayers and Dragon Slayers will of course allow for more Slayer-focused armies, which are not the best or most cost-effective in campaign, but can certainly be a lot of fun. And Doom Seekers are going to be crazy. They're Slayer chosen with low model counts, but double spinning axe blades on the end of chains meant to carve through hordes like butter. The Goblin Hewer is an axe throwing contraption crewed by Slayers. Short range, but massive damage with a crew that can actually fight in melee. So basically you try to tie it up in melee with Cav or whatever, and then the Slayers just end up killing you anyway. Grudge Rakers are shotguns, also short range and massive damage for deleting those big scary monsters. And Slayer Pirates are Slayers with flintlock pistols, cutlasses, eye patches, and parrots. Go figure. No Rune Guardians, no Shard Dragons, but a really thematic and interesting selection of units with a big centerpiece model that will completely change the game for the Dawi. The Thunder Barge has the potential to just absolutely pwn. I mean, this thing will be able to shellac enemy armies with impunity if they don't have an aerial presence, and with all these new range tools, having an air force is no guarantee you'll be able to kill it quickly anyway. Like, yeah, you can send Pegasus and a Hippogriff after it, but there's a bunch of Thunderers and Slayer Pirates all shooting up at you. You can't really take that fight. So the Thunder Barge is just sitting above its own army in range of its own artillery and gunpowder troops. That's going to be really tough to displace. I really like what they've done with the Dwarf side here. Of course, we don't know all the details yet about their campaign updates and all that stuff. But if we get some Kara's Angkor love, fast traveling using the Underway and maybe some new stuff with the Great Book of Grudges, could be a really good update for the Dawi, and it's been long requested, it's been long needed. I'm excited to see what they do with them here. Overall, loving the selection of units, lords, and heroes across all three factions. Thrones of Decay is looking like a much better value than Shadows of Change was on launch, with more content and the ability to pick and choose the factions you want, without having to pay for the entire DLC if you don't want all of it. So in the coming days, we'll be talking more about each of their unique campaign mechanics and Epidemius, the free new lord for Nurgle, but lots more detail on the way. Hope you all enjoyed this first look at Thrones of Decay and many more videos to follow soon. See you all in the next one.